part three of the Purim story, of the Esther story, we're in the middle of the dialogue between Esther and Mordechai. Mordechai had refused to come to Esther, and so they're having this conversation by way of messengers. And as we mentioned before, one opinion is that Hasach, this messenger, who we never really hear of his name before or his name afterwards, is actually Daniel, Daniel, the same prophet who was thrown into the lion's den earlier. When he comes back to Esther with the with the news and an actual copy of the decree, so Esther could literally see for herself what was planned out for the Jewish people, the genocide that had been planned out so meticulously by Haman, Esther had two reasons why she didn't want to go to, to Mordechai. One was she hadn't been summoned, and the other one is the king hadn't called her in 30 days. But the summoning was part of a very intense... Um, set of rules that Haman had placed down to ensure that he had full control over the crown. He wanted to make sure that people didn't just walk into the king and and start saying their opinions. So Haman had a whole set of guards, guards that guarded the inner part of the, or the outer part first of the king's um, doorways that led to his throne room, and also guards that, that guarded the inner part. And he made sure that nothing would get through. And his biggest concern was to make sure that no one got close enough to the king so that they could annul his decree against the Jewish people. Now, the decree had just been made. According to one opinion, either it was it, it, either it was that day or Esther was going to go on the following day. But whatever the case was, Haman's decree was exceptionally fresh. It had just been happening. And that actually led to Esther's second reason why she tells Mordechai she doesn't want to go. She said... The king hasn't called me in 30 days. And one opinion says, 30 days is such a long time for the king not to call his wife. Which meant she was telling Mordechai, the decree has just been made. And yes, it's a decree of genocide. It's very serious. And, you know, the ramifications are dreadful. But why are we rushing into this? Putting my life at risk. Putting the one person who has the best chance of, of annulling this decree in danger. Let's just wait a few days. 30 days is already so long and the king hasn't called me yet, which means it's a matter of time until the king calls me. Let's just hold out, wait a few days. Why am I rushing into this? Let's plan this out meticulously instead of just rushing into the king without calculating this all properly. It's going to be a very big theme throughout this part of the story that so much of Esther and Mordechai's plans didn't really have to hinge that much on logic. It was almost like Mordechai and Esther wanted to do the bare minimum and everything else they just left up to Hashem. I mean, that's actually what Mordechai's intention was. He was, and Esther does too, was to just leave everything up to Hashem and do the absolute bare minimum. But Esther's initial reaction was, why are we rushing into this? Let's just, let's just wait. Let's wait a few days. It's a matter of time till the king calls me. And when the king does call me, well then... I'll, I'll tell him what, everything I need to say. But why risk being cut down by guards even before I go in, into, the, into, the, into the king? Now, what's really interesting is when those messengers, when the, the message of Esther's refusal to go into, the, into Ahasuerus makes its way to Mordechai, the Megillah records it, but the Megillah says, and they told them, of them to Esther. Like the message was told, Mordechai told through them. And doesn't say Hasach, it doesn't say him. It's almost like Hasach didn't fulfill that mission that Mordechai had, that Esther had entrusted him to do, to send that message to, um, to, Mordech, to Mordechai. And there's actually opinions about this. They, the, the one opinion says, Haman saw Hasach, and it doesn't matter who it was, whether it was Hasach, was Daniel, or Hasach was just a high-ranking official um, in, the, in Esther's palace, in the king's palace, but Haman saw um, Hasach coming in and out of Esther's um, quarters and saw him going towards Mordechai and Haman started to get very suspicious. He was an extremely suspicious man in nature and he decided that something something untoward is going on. Something suspicious is going on and he just do, he wanted to have none of it. So he killed Hasach. Now if Hasach was Daniel, that is the, uh, such an unbelievable, dreadful twist in the story that Daniel, Daniel, the famous prophet who was so dedicated to the Jewish people for decades on end, serving so many kings, non-Jewish kings, and helping the Jewish people along the way, was killed by Haman literally in the middle of the Purim story, which 
according to some opinions, actually say that it was with the passing of Daniel, because he was a righteous man. Whenever a righteous man passes away, it creates incredible atonement for the Jewish people. So Jewish people had done, you know, they were in a Shuvah movement. As we're going to see, as we're going to see further, the passing of the. Well, the murder of Daniel was something that created an incredible amount of graciousness um, from Hashem to the Jewish people, because when a, when a righteous man passes away, that's what that's what is affected. There's opinion that says it makes no sense for Daniel to be the person that was killed by Haman, because later on in the story of Darius too, the the the, the child of Ahasuerus and Esther, Daniel is mentioned. So. To say that he served Darius II when he was killed during the, hum the Purim story, of course, doesn't make any chronological sense. Some people say that Daniel was in Hasach, two different people, and, and, and that's, that's the proof of it that Daniel is mentioned later on. There is, there is an opinion that says Daniel was Hasach, or Hasach was the, the messenger, and why does, does it not say that that that, that that Hasach mentioned it when Hasach saw that Dan that Esther was refusing Mordechai's instructions and she she was trying to give excuses from for going for not going directly to the king. Hasach told Esther, "I'm not going to be your messenger. I'm your messenger so long as I agree with what you're sending. But if you're going to send a message that's that's implying that you're not ready right now to listen to Mordechai's instructions, send another messenger." So Esther had no choice. So Esther called one of her own loyal messengers and said, okay, I need you to bring this message to, to Mordechai. And therefore, when the Megillah re records it, the Megillah actually makes a little hint that Hasach wasn't the one that brought that message to Mordechai. But regardless, the message went to Mordechai, however it was. And there are, there are other opinions of, of how that message went, especially if, if Hasach was killed. How did Mordechai get the message? But he got it. He, he was informed of this. And Esther, Mordechai sent a message back to Esther. And this mes message is extremely harsh, especially with the understanding that Mordechai and Esther's relationship, according to many opinions, Rashi and the Masha, for example, that that was the end of their relationship. What Mordechai was asking of Esther was so unbelievably large to both of them. Mordechai and Esther were husband and wife, and they loved each other dearly, and that was essentially the end of their relationship. And Mordechai, when he hears that Esther's deliberating about, you know, revealing her identity and telling the king to to redeem the, to to free the Jewish people from this terrible persecution, Mordechai tells Esther, "Either you go, or you don't go, but salvation is going to come to the Jewish people. And if the Jewish people, the Jewish people are going to get salvation regardless, but you you're." ability to be a part of this miracle you and your father's house is going to be entirely lost Mordechai told Esther that she has two choices either help the Jewish people or not help the Jewish people, the Jewish people are going to have help anyway Hashem is going to find a way to save the Jewish people but if she chooses to do the right thing she'll be, she'll be in the right position and if she doesn't she won't it's very interesting because the, there was a very interesting story where the where the fourth Chabad Rebbe during the persecutions in Russia in the 1880s there were riots and Jews were getting murdered in the street. The persecution during those days were absolutely dreadful. And the Rebbe Marash, the fourth Chabad Rebbe, traveled to the capital city, gathered a whole bunch of officials, and told these officials, unfortunately many of them were Jewish, and told these people that. Um, or they were, they were wealthy people that had, you know, they had a lot of access, told them to help. And they, you know, they, they didn't want to help. And the, the Rebbe Marash gave them the same, the same threat that Mordechai gave to Esther. He said, the Jewish people are going to be saved. The question is, will, the, will you be part of this story? Will you be able to be saved along with them? Or will the Jewish people get freed anyway? And, you know, the consequences of not helping them fall on your head. And Mordechai additionally told Esther, she, Mordechai told Esther, I had a vision that you had something special to do when you, for you to go into, into the king's palace. Remember, Mordechai wasn't just a regular person, not even a great person. Mordechai was a prophet, which, mean, which means that when he, he saw or felt things, these were divinely inspired things. And now Mordechai is telling Esther, I felt that you belong here, and this is the reason. So for you to not, to not see this through, for you not to go to the king, whatever the ramifications are going to be, whether it's the end of our marriage or you're going to get killed, this is where you belong right now. Make sure that you see this through. And Esther did. That was that was the end of the conversation. So the, the you know there was there was a dialogue, and in the Megillah itself, you know, it keeps on saying that Esther sent to Mordechai, Mordechai sent to Esther, and you see that they're both there is this dialogue going on. But at this point, Esther understands that this is her this is her job, this is her life mission. She needs to go and see this through, and the incredible sacrifice that she 
that she had. And when the rest of the Jewish people are celebrating at the end of the story, Esther's life was never the same from, you know, when she decided to literally lay down absolutely everything to, to, to make sure that the Jewish people survived. But Esther asked for Mordechai uh, uh, a favor, not a favor, but almost like a command. It's very interesting how Esther phrases it in the, in, the, in the Megillah. Esther says to make a public fast for three days. And she says that her and her maidservants will, will fast as well. But she wanted all the Jewish people to all fast together. And her strategy was like this, she would fast, and then after fasting, whether it was for two days, or whether it was she should fast for three days, she would then go into the king, and then she would tell the king that she's Jewish and please save the Jewish people. And what's so amazing, and the Lubavitcher Rebbe talks about this, and we touched upon this a moment ago and in the previous classes, Esther realized that the critical mistake the Jewish people had made when they went to the big feast of Ahasuerus was they relied on their connections. They said, well, we don't really need God because look, Ahasuerus is our buddy. He invited us to his feast. Yes, the feast might be celebrating the destruction of the, of the first temple, but look, Ahasuerus is our feast. And the Gemara even asks, how is it possible that Jewish people all deserve to be wiped out for going to a feast? I mean, a feast is, even if you're going to say the feast had not kosher food, is that really a reason that every single Jewish person deserves to be wiped? That is, it's such a surprising um, a consequence. How is it possible you get punished in such a dramatic way? Everyone wiped out for going to a, going to a feast. It just doesn't sound, doesn't sound in line with any form of justice. The explanation is the Jewish people weren't getting punished by being wiped out because they went to the feast. The feast was a declaration to God saying, we got it. Usually, the sheep always needs the shepherd because otherwise the wolves are going to come and eat the sheep up. In this case, the Jewish people told God, God, you're a shepherd usually, but look, this wolf is our friend. He invited us to a party. We don't need you anymore. And God said, oh, okay, no problem. I'll take a step back. It wasn't a punishment that suddenly the persecution came their way and all the Jewish people were supposed to be wiped out. It was a natural order of things that a wolf eats a sheep. So the sheep tells the shepherd to go away. Now the wolf is, is thrilled because look, there's no one protecting the sheep. And Esther realized that her job now was for herself and for the Jewish people and to show the Jewish people that we need to realize the priority. Everything is run by God. God's our shepherd and he's taking care of us. And we need everything to be taken care of by God. And if God steps away for a second and isn't, you know, stopping the, the natural order of things, the wolf will eat, eat us up. Now, because we're in this world, God expects us to, to do our due diligence. But Esther wanted to show the Jewish people the due diligence. For example, a person in business. A person says, you know what, I'm waiting for God to send me money. I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, um, go to work. Well, of course, that's ridiculous. He needs to go to work. But he needs to remember while he's working, the, the channel, the way he makes his money is not because of the work that he's doing. His work he's doing is because he lives in this world and God expects him to make a job. But where's his success coming from? Where's every single penny that he's making from come from? It all comes from God. So Esther said, I need to play politics. Now. Okay, I'll go to the king. Why did the king pick Esther in the first place? Because she was beautiful. So the worst thing that she could possibly do was fast. But that's what she, exactly what she did. She fasted for three days straight, emaciating herself to such a degree that she could barely stand. And then she goes into the king. She's trying to show the Jewish people, trying to show Hashem, and trying to show herself that the way I have success, the way the Purim story is going to be a happy story in the end is because God's going to help us. I... I need to go to the king. Fantastic. I'll, I'll go. But I'm going to do nothing more than just go because everything is up to God. So I'll show up. And then all the success, I'll let it be all God's. Even if I'm fasting and I'm not looking as beautiful as, as what you know, could be expected for someone that's trying to get a king to, rev to revoke a decree that he very much wants to see through. So it, it was, it, it was a, it's, it's a, a beautiful lesson. But Esther's fast was a fast for three days. And the question, of course, is... When was the actual fast? Because the chronology of it was very interesting. The the three over the three large opinions when it comes to when exactly the fast um, was. One opinion says it was the thirteenth of Nisan, the fourteenth of Nisan, and the fifteenth of Nisan. Another opinion says that it was the fourteenth, the fifteenth, and the sixteenth of Nisan. And there's another opinion which isn't as well known, but it is still an opinion, and that is that it was Bahab. Bahab was a, 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 a I mean, till recently, a very popular type of fasting. People would do it after after all the festivals, you know, in case people got too frivolous during the festivals and got a little carried away. They would kind of tell Hashem, okay, I'm really sorry about it. Nowadays, we don't encourage fasting. But in the olden days, this was something that people always kept. And it's Monday, Thursday, Monday. 
And the reason why the the Bahab was was in order is because three days fasting straight is either impossible or extremely dangerous. So to say that Esther made a uh, made a fast for three days straight is a little difficult. But what's actually interesting is most people say that that actually is what happened. The Jewish people fasted for three days straight, and so de- depending on when it was, um, that that's that you know that 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 was the three consecutive days according to. You know, most opinions of when the Jewish people fast. But according to all opinions, and this is what's so controversial, according to all opinions, the fast fell out on the first day of Pesach. And we know, according to law, it is forbidden to fast on a festival. You can't just fast on on Sukkot or on Pesach, on Shavuos. It's absolutely forbidden. It's a special day. It's a holy day. It's a day which we celebrate through eating and drinking. And the question, of course, was... How is Esther asking Mordechai to make a fast on Pesach? In fact, when Mordechai heard that, Mordechai refused. Mordechai said, that's, we'll fast, but on, to fast on, on Pesach, that's against law. And Esther actually sent back a message. And Esther said, Elder, that's actually how she addressed him. Elder of the Jewish people. If there's no Jews in the world, she argued, what uses mitzvahs? What uses Torah? What uses Pesach? She said, better let's desecrate one Pesach this year and then all the future Pesachs, because we'll still be alive and we'll be freed because we ask God for forgiveness, we'll be able to keep those. And Mordechai heard her rationale and Mordechai actually agreed. And he set forth this this uh, fast day, um, even though it was absolutely a, a forbidden thing to do. And Esther told Mordechai, Esther told Mordechai, you're a leader of the Jewish people and Jewish leaders are, are have permission to make exceptions. Now, a an exception, like discounting a rule in the Torah forever, is forbidden. But to make a one-time exception, like for example, one of the most famous ones is Elijah Elio Hanavi on the on Mount Carmel, where he sacrificed outside the base of Egypt, which was absolutely forbidden. But because he was the leader of the Jewish people, he made a one-time exception to the prophet, and therefore it was actually kept. Esther said, told the same thing, same thing to Mordechai: "You're a leader of the Jewish people." With the authority of the Torah and the, the 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 power of your your you know your rabbinic position, you're allowed to not remove Pesach forever. That would be straight away. That would be an absolutely forbidden. No no one's allowed to get rid of anything from the Torah, but temporarily suspend uh, an item in the Torah temporarily. That's the operative word. That's permissible. So making a fast for one just for this year, you could make that exception. And Esther also told es- uh, Mordechai something really interesting. And you literally see it in the words of the Megillah. As I mentioned earlier a few times, everything, if you just dig into the actual words of the Megillah, it's, it's all there for the taking. It's, it's, it's brilliant. These tiny little subtleties in the words of the Megillah un- are able to unpack so much tremendous amount of, of understanding of what really went down in the Purim story. Esther says, Vitsumu alai, she says, fast on me. Now, you know, when you're reading through it, you know, just without without paying much attention, it sounds like fast for me. But that's not what the words say. The words say fast on me. That's a very strange phraseology. And, the you know, the rabbis, of course, go to town on that. And they're like, well, what 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 is she saying? And Esther was telling Mordechai, many years earlier, Rivka went, now this is many, many years earlier, Rebecca to Jacob, Yaakov. Rivka. Rivka goes to her son, Yaakov, and tells her son, your older brother's about to take the blessings. I want you to sneak in. I want you to steal them. And Yaakov said, you mean steal them from my father, who's a great righteous man, who's going to discover and then curse me. I, that's a bit of a risky move. And Rivka told Yaakov like this. She said, I have a, I'm a prophet. Rivka was a prophet. And I, and I know through prophecy that you will not be harmed by doing this. You'll be fine. So therefore, do it, and whenever trouble comes your way, it'll be on me. You have nothing to fear. And Yaakov, understanding that his, that his mother was a prophet, said, okay, if that's the case, if you're so confident about this, I'll rely on your prophecy, and I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll steal the blessings, which in, which in fact he did, and those blessings still carry on to this day. Esther told Mordechai the same thing. Fast on me. I know that no harm will come to the Jewish people, even though they're breaking Pesach by fasting on it. Passover is literally, it's forbidden to fast. And Esther told Mordechai, fast on me. I'm so confident this is what Hashem wants. And remember, she was a prophet. Fast on me. And Mordechai said, well, that's good. if that's good enough for you, just like he understood from earlier on in history, he, Mordechai understood from Esther that if Esther, because she was a prophet, she's listed one of the seven prophetesses, um, if she uh, has a prophecy, this is what's supposed to happen, that's good enough. And Mordechai declared the fast. 
And what's really interesting is the, the Rebbe's father in Penine Levi Yitzchak, he, he explains that like Avram and Sarah, where Sarah in the Torah, in the, in the actual text itself, it says that Sarah's prophecy was greater, Mordechai understood that Esther's prophecy was also greater. And what's really interesting is when the book of the Megillah was ready, to, was finished, Mordechai wanted it to be inserted into the, you know, the official text of the Bible, to be one of the books of the Torah. And the rabbis weren't too keen on it. They're like, why, why are we adding it in? And then Esther demanded. And the rabbis understood that her level of prophecy was so great that they couldn't argue with her. And that's exactly what happened. The book of Esther is part of the official text of the Torah. And it wasn't because of Mordechai, it was because of Esther. The fact that Megillah even hints to it. The, what's really interesting, one little side note that I found absolutely fascinating, is the f- fasting on, a, on, a, on Pesach is a very serious infraction. It's absolutely forbidden. But there's something even worse, and that is we have a mitzvah on the day of Pesach to eat matzah. Not eating matzah on Pesach is way, way bigger, bigger of a sin. Now, if you don't have access to the matzah, Okay, then you know. Then what? What, what are you? What are you going to do? You don't have access to matzah. You don't have access to matzah. It's not your fault. Hashem, you know, God says, okay, it's, it's out of your control. But in this case, it didn't sound like they didn't have. They have. They of course had access, but now they're fasting. So how is it possible that the whole discussion doesn't bring up? You know, how does Mordechai not tell Esther? But what about the Pesach Seder? How are people not going to eat matzah on the night of Pesach? There was a German rabbi living in the 1800s called the Arach Lanair, and he gave a very creative answer. He said, because there's no discussion about this, you know, eating matzah on Pesach inside the Gemara, and the rabbis don't bring it up, it must be that the Jewish people must have had all of them on the night of Pesach, they must have all had less than an olive size of matzah. It wouldn't have broken the fast because having less than olive size, you know, it would have been small enough, a tiny little amount that wouldn't, wouldn't have broken the fast but at the same time would have been enough for them to at least have a touch of matzah, and that way they fulfilled their obligation of having matzah, at least according to an opinion, at the same time they still hadn't broken their fast, which is such a creative, um, a, such a creative answer, a, a answer to such a massive question. Why did Esther want the fast? I mean, at surface value, it's very easy. You know, Esther was going on a very, very dangerous mission, and she, she wanted to be successful, and you know, she needed the Jewish people to, to help her out and give her, you know, that... that fortitude that fasting will, brings to the Jewish people. And just like when Jewish people gather today, when, when there's any ever trouble and we fast and we say to Hillam and we give charity, Esther wanted the Jewish people to, you know, to help her out for this very terrifying mission. It was basically a suicide mission. There was no chance she was going to survive this. And so she told the Jewish people, pray for me and fast on my behalf. But that's not the only reason. There's actually, there's a bigger reason that, that, that's given. The Medrash, Medrash to Hillam brings down a reason and says, Esther understood why were the Jewish people having this massive persecution because they'd eaten and drank at Ahasuerus' feast. Uh, Esther realized they needed to take that very weapon that they used to sin, that eating and drinking, and they needed to use the, utilize that for positivity. So she said, well, how do you do that by fasting? Use what you used in an in a incorrect way and, you know, now you utilize it in a fasting method. Correct what you did by eating inappropriately to refrain from eating. And an additional reason that's brought down that's very interesting is Esther said, "When how did Haman get this? This this how did Haman convince Ahasuerus to to persecute the Jews?" Haman said one of the most classic anti-Semitic tropes: "Everyone hates the Jews. No one's going to care." In fact, Haman claimed the Jews hate themselves. Look at them; they fight all day. As I said, if we want to abolish this decree, the first thing we need to do is we need to have unity. We need to all gather together, all of us on the same page, and for three days, everyone's going to fast. Fasting is a very universally similar activity. No one does it greater than another. It's all, everyone's in it together. And as I said, as I said let's all fast, showing ourselves, showing God, and showing the rest of the world, we are united. This, this, um, misconception that Jews always fight amongst each other, Esther wanted to prove this is not true. This is not who we are. And the third the third reason why Esther asked, or fourth reason why Esther asked um, for the, the Jewish people to pray for her and for fast for her was actually a little a little sad that the mom Les brings down that she was going to do a bunch of sins now. And she wanted, she wanted, she knew she had it, she had to do it. This was the right thing to do. This was saving lives of the Jewish people, literally saving the Jews from genocide. At the same time, it, 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 she had a very big conscience on her shoulders, and she needed the Jewish people to like pray to fast on her, to fast for her sake. And the first one was at the feast that she was now going to prepare for Achashverosh and for Haman. She was going to eat not kosher food. Of course, she was saving lives, but 
the same time. It, it was something that troubled her. So she said, pray on my behalf. The next thing, which we already discussed at a great length, is she was going willingly to the king, which was a sin. Until now, she'd been a captive. Now she's going willingly. Just for a matter of clarity, there are, there are opinions that say that this wasn't considered going to the king willingly. And there are opinions that say that Mordechai and Esther, at the end of the Purim story, could still get married to each other because the whole time Esther was considered like a like a forced captive. And this going to the king to 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 you know, beg on behalf of herself and her people was not considered going willingly. That was very much going against her will. And the third reason why she asked the Jewish people to, to fast for her, she felt so guilty for the death of Hassel. Had she not had this back and forth with Mordechai and she just agreed right away to go to, to Achashverosh, well, then Hasach wouldn't have been dead. Haman wouldn't have killed because there, there would have been one, le one less time going back and forth. And because she had gone back and forth, she kind of gave herself some of the blame for, for you know, what had happened for the passing of Hasach. And she asked the Jewish people to pray on, to fast and pray on her, on her behalf. And then she committed to go to Achashverosh. It says in the Megillah that Esther went on the third day. And most people, you know, they read it plainly, the third day of the fast. But actually, that's not so simple. There are opinions about it. There, there is an opinion that says that it was the third day of the fast. But both Rashi in the Megillah Sesta and Rashi in the Gemara both say it wasn't the third day of the fast. Or Rashi and Esther says the third day of the fast. But the, Rashi in the Gemara say, says it was the third day of the edict. But it was the second day of the fast. And that actually makes a lot of sense based on the fact that Esther didn't eat in the first feast. Well, we'll get there. Esther went on the third day. However you want to learn the third day, whatever it means, she went on the third day. And because she was going into the king, even though she was so not in the, the mindset and the, the zone to go to the king, she was so elevated, she was so such a spiritual level after fasting, whether for two days or for three days, she didn't go with a sackcloth and ashes. Mordechai refused to go into the castle because he refused to put on sackcloth and ashes. In her case, she was going into the king, which meant she had to remove her sackcloth and ashes. What she, this said she'd been wearing for the past few days. So she took off the sackcloth and ashes and she donned royal clothes. In fact, the Mamlez brings down a whole list of all the different um, locations where all her royal garments came from and the stones that she wore came from. It's very, it's very interesting and it's, it's amazing how we have all these incredible details of, you know, just elements of this miracle and, this, and the story of Esther. The rabbis say that her, when she was going towards the king, her face literally shone. And it was a repayment. She spent years instructed by Mordechai to keep a secret. Keeping a secret for a day, for two days, for a year, for two it takes a toll on someone. You know, it's very hard to keep a secret and not reveal, especially something as large and as big as this one. The fact that she's Jewish and the fact that she's of royalty. And she's keeping the secret from the most powerful man alive, King Ahasuerus, her own husband. It was it was such a massive emotional journey such a such a strength in character to be to be able to keep this secret and Hashem rewarded her now and Hashem literally made her face shine and when it says that she donned clothes she donned royalty the rabbis explained it wasn't just the royal clothing that she put on but she literally donned Ruach HaKadosh she was she was receiving divine presence she was an incredible amount of rev spiritual revelation was going on as she was walking from you know still fasting walking from her section of the castle to the throne room and as soon as she entered the throne room and as, I, as i'm going to mention in a moment throne room was was wasn't just one room it was a bunch of doorways but as she entered there it all left all that divine presence left her because now she was, it was you know it's king Ahasuerus. he was an idolatry he was he served idols he had idols everywhere and so when she entered that room that was it she was in the presence of idols and the 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 divine presence left her. In fact, the famous quote in Tehillim that says, Keli, Keli, Lama Satani, God, God, um, um, why have you forsaken me? Chapter 22. That was, that was something that she actually invoked. She said, I spent, I, I spent years in the palace keeping Torah, keeping mitzvahs, doing all the right things. And Hashem has, hasn't made any miracle for me yet. Sarah, my ancestor, when she was captured by King Pharaoh, you know, Abraham's wife, Abraham's wife had been captured by King Pharaoh. That very night, angels came and started beating power, started making a dreadful um, illnesses go to all the Egyptians that were in the palace. It was complete chaos, and it was her being in the palace for literally one night. Esther said, I don't get it. I've been, I've been here for years. Where's my miracle? Three maidservants accompanied Esther as she went into the throne room. Two on, one on either side. 
and one behind. And it's as we're going to mention in a moment. It was very good that she that she had them there. She walked with so much authority. It wasn't like she she tippy-toed in. She knew she was going to be killed. The guards had had instructions from Haman. If anyone comes without permission, kill them on the spot. Don't do not let anyone come in. And she walked with so much authority. The guards were completely. They they've been taken completely off. And she walked past the third gate. The third or third doorway. The third doorway was already out of the jurisdiction of the outer guards. So they were so shocked that someone would show up, especially the queen, walking so royally and marching right past them, that by the time they collected themselves, Esther had already left. He had already gone beyond their their control, and now it was the inner guards that had, you know, had the job to kill her. And But they waited. The king now looks at her. And as the second that the king saw her, the king began to grind his teeth. He was so furious. And Esther saw that fury in his eyes. And she became so weak that she literally had to lean on the maidservants that were at her side from collapsing. Remember, she hadn't eaten. She was starving. And it wasn't like she just hadn't eaten during the day. She hadn't eaten for day and night. She hadn't eaten for either two days straight or three days straight. The amount of... She was so unbelievably weak. And now she sees the the fury that the king has and she realizes, okay, that's it. And it wasn't about the death, I imagine, that she was scared of, but it was you know, all the lives of the Jewish people across the world, complete genocide, was all depending on the success of this mission. And the king, meanwhile, was furious. He said to himself, my first wife, Vashti, I, I requested her to come and she refused. This one shows up without even a request. Like, I tell her she's not allowed to come and she decides she's coming anyway. She's like, that's so much worse than not showing up. When the, the guards saw the king's um, reaction, the guards already started dividing the belongings. They're like, okay, this, this necklace I'll take, this uh, clothing I'll take. They already realized that that's, it, she's dead. It's a matter, it's a matter of, of, of moments until she's, until she's going to be dead. Now, the big miracle that some of the rabbis bring up is that the king wasn't in his regular spot. Had the king been in his regular spot where he usually sat in his, in his castle, Esther would have been killed on the spot because the, guards, the king would have never seen her. And he, though the king was furious when he saw her, the fact that he saw her is what ends up saving her life. But at this point, she's, she's still furious. But the king could see her from a location where usually he wasn't sitting from. And this is a part of that hidden miracle. How you know, It's not an outright miracle. Why was the king there that day? You could, you could just say he, he changed his spot. But at the same time, it's so unbelievably miraculous because him being there is the only reason why Esther managed to make it out alive. And it's just, it's that incredible, that same theme that it's, it's everything was in, within nature, nothing went above it. But at the same time, that, that many um, coincidences, let's call it, all lining up is, is such an incredible miracle. It's so much, it's so far beyond what you could describe as being nature. It's a miracle within nature. It's tremendous. At, at that moment, um, the three angels came. And the three angels all had three different jobs. One of them raised up her neck. Remember, the Jewish people had, had done repentance. They spent the past two or three days repenting to God. The, 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 the miracle hasn't yet, hasn't yet happened yet. It's far from, from over yet. But at the same time, Hashem's setting in motion the, 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 the end of the miracle. So Esther obviously can't be killed. And Hashem's sending angels to save her. Hashem raises up her neck. She's, she, she was weak. She was collapsing. She saw the fury of the king and literally started fall, falling. And so an uh, angel came and raised up her neck, make, giving her that confidence. And the second one hung a strong cord of grace around her. Remember, Esther was someone who was extremely graceful, but someone that had fasted for this, this amount of time and was in this type of you know, um, um, mental situation, you know, agony of, of fasting and repentance. They, they, they didn't have no one like that as graceful. And an uh, angel came and, and gave this incredible grace to her. And the third angel, and this is very interesting, took this king's scepter, which he, which was like his way, it's like a stick, essentially, a royal stick. I'm sure it was made in a very royal, you know, gold and gems and all that, I, I imagine, and l stretched it out. So even though that according to, you know, some opinions is that the, the king was, was, was on his own, but it sounds like from, from this version that, you know, at, at first, in the first moment, the king might have not been so um, excited about, um, seeing Esther, but the angel stretching the scepter of the king automatically, you know, stopped what was about to happen. Because at the second that the soldiers saw the king grinding his teeth, straight away they got into action and they rushed towards Esther to kill her. 
And then the moment that the scepter was raised and started extending itself, well, then, they, of course, they froze and they stepped back because they realized the king had now invited her, essentially, into the throne room. The, there's a really interesting discussion in the Gemara, how long the scepter stretched, which is really interesting. According to some opinions, it really, really stretched. We're talking about an extreme distance. When I say stretched, it means it actually just extended, almost like the, or not almost, literally like the story of Basio when she saw Moshe in the, in the, in the river. And she... You know, her maidservants wanted to go and see who that who the baby was inside of the the, the basket, and and Basia's hand arm literally stretched her. She she could be the first one to grab the basket, thereby saving Moshe's life. This is a similar type of thing. This king's scepter literally stretched and invited her into the room, and the king saw how how worried and how how weak. She was. I, I, I doubt the king understood that she had been fasting, but the king understood that she was extremely alarmed. And so the king made her feel better. The king literally calmed her down and told her, don't be alarmed, don't be worried. And the king even told her, this rule of, of not being able to go into the king without permission, that's only for everyone else, but you're my wife. You, Of course you can come whenever you want. You don't need to be worried. You don't need to be alarmed. And Ahasuerus at that point tells her, listen, when, if, if you were under the impression that your life was in danger by coming to me, or that's going to one opinion. According to another opinion, if you endangered your life to come to me, it means whatever you want is of extreme importance. Tell me what it is. And he said, I will give you up to half my kingdom. That's how willing I am to make sure that your take that whatever you could possibly want right now is taken care of. Esther didn't want to tell the king then and there what the what the request was. And so instead of straight away telling the king exactly what the matter was, Esther postponed a little. And the question, of course, is why she postponed, and that's a discussion for of itself. But the point was, Esther had an agenda of her own. She had a motive, and she wanted to make sure that the that the situation was positioned in such a way that she could get the most out of this. So the king had 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 told her he'll give her up, up to half the kingdom. And on that note, by the way, the, the rabbis say half the kingdom. It's a very strange expression. I'll give you up to half the kingdom. Say, say the rabbis up to halfway through the kingdom. Ahasuerus was hinting to something very specific. Ahasuerus knew at this point, as we mentioned earlier, that Esther had been raised by Mordechai. She, he had no idea that she was Jewish. But she, he did know that she, that she was very partial to, to Mordechai and to Jewish interests. And he told her, if you're going to ask for that thing, that untold thing, that unspoken thing that's halfway through my kingdom. Now, if you do the math and work out halfway through the the, the kingdom of Ahasuerus, bang in the middle of his kingdom is Jerusalem. Now, renovation had already started of building bu- the building of the temple. Of course, it had been stopped by the king, and then by the earlier king, and then stopped again by Ahasuerus. And he told Esther, ask whatever you want and I'll give it to you. But do not ask for that thing that's halfway through my kingdom because I'm not going to rebuild the temple. Ahasuerus was terrified of this prediction. There was a prediction that had said his kingdom is going to be taken over by a Jew. A Jew is going to wear his crown and is going to you know, take over his kingdom. Ahasuerus had this prediction and he knew it to be accurate. And so he hated Jews. It wasn't a Haman-like hatred. It was just, you know, it was almost like a self-preservation type of hatred. He was a bad person, make no mistake about it. Ahasuerus was an extremely wicked person. But his hatred of the Jews was, was, it was amplified in a massive way by him understanding that this prophecy, this prediction that he was going to be taken over by a Jew. He just said, well, I got to get rid of the Jews because if they're no Jews, well, then no one's going to, you know, kill me and take over my throne. What's funny is, his prediction was absolutely right, and he understood that later on. His son, Esther's daughter, Esther's son, his and Esther's son, Darius II, was Jewish because Darius's mother was a Jew. So it was a strange, it was a strange prediction that Ahasuerus knew to be true, which was in fact true, but it made until the end when Ahasuerus understood what it all meant, it made that prophecy uh a, a linchpin in Ahasuerus's deep, deep hatred of the Jewish people. And so he told us, he told Esther, if you're coming here to ask for the rebuilding of the temple, don't ask, because that's the one thing I won't do. There's another opinion that just says simply, he said, up to half my kingdom, he, it was, it was a, you know, a poetic way to say, I'm so willing to do what you want. If you want to secede and make your own kingdom and take half of it with you, that's how willing I am to do whatever you want. Tell me what it is, because I'll do it. Up to half my kingdom you could even keep. 
It's just an expression. But there's an opinion that says he was he was specifically talking about the the temple, and he 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 was making it clear. I'll do it. I'll do anything, but I won't. And Esther only asked. She said, "I want to make a feast, and I want you to bring Haman along to the feast." That was her. That was her request. The feast was going to be that that day. Esther was still fasting, according to most opinions, and so Esther told the king, "I want you and Haman to come to the feast." And the question, of course, is why did Esther invite Haman to the feast? What what could she the what could she have possibly wanted from from Esther at the feast? The the feast, what she really was asking the request was for, was from the king. Haman, as powerful as he was, and he literally ran the kingdom, and Achitreus sat back and pretty much did nothing. At the same time, this decree. Haman, of course, would have said no to. You know, or this request Haman would have said no to. So why exactly was Haman invited to the feast? What was Esther's plan? The Gemara brings an incredible amount of opinions. And I'm actually going to bring, I'm actually going to mention all the opinions because it's just so fascinating how many opinions there are of different rabbis that say different things for the motive that Esther had for bringing Haman to the feast. And then the twist at the end is just fantastic. Rabbi Eliezer says in the Gemara, the reason why Esther invited Haman to the feast was to trip up Haman. Esther wanted Haman to make a mistake or wanted to, to, to catch Haman out in a mistake. And therefore she said, I could invite Ahasuerus and just have a, have a romantic date with just the king or I can invite Haman as well and find a way to trip him up. Rabbi Yeshua said... Esther heard young children. Remember this theme we already had earlier on. Mordechai listened to young children and, and you know, having hope that the Jewish people are going to be saved. Esther had heard young children saying that if your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. So Esther said, okay, my enemy is hungry. Haman's my enemy. I, that, that's a message for me. That's what I need to do. It's like a half prophecy. I need to invite um, Haman to the feast and give him something to eat. But Meir said, Esther wanted to keep Haman close. Because the that if the king would get ha- angry at Haman and Haman wasn't near the king, Haman was extremely powerful. He could build up a massive rebellion and kill the king. And Esther said, "Well, that's I can't have that. It's better keep Haman close by. That way, if anything goes wrong and Haman starts to get very alarmed about the way things are going, he's right next to the king, and he can't just muster up all the all his allies and make a massive coup and kill the king in the in the interim." Rabbi Yehuda said, the reason why she invited Haman to the feast is that Esther was getting worried that Haman was catching on who she was, that she was secretly Jewish. And Esther said, well, for me to successfully you know, do what I need to do next, I need to make sure that Haman is, isn't catching on, he isn't cluing in that I'm actually Jewish. So she said, the best way to ensure that he has no idea is if I'm kind to him and invite him to a personal intimate meal, just me and the king, and I also invite him too, he'll never imagine I'm Jewish because he knows, Haman knows that everyone knows at this point that he had made a decree against the Jewish people. So Esther said, best way to keep Haman's guard down than not to work out that she's Jewish is to very be really kind to him, invite him to the feast. His guards will be so down. Rabbi Nehemiah says, it, was, it wasn't about Haman. Esther was worried that people, the Jewish people, who knew that she was Jewish and living in the castle, they would always say, you know, we don't really need to pray that hard to God because you know what? Esther's there. She's gonna, she'll take care of us. She's, she's the queen. So Esther said, you know what? I need the Jewish people to pray so hard. I need to make sure that they don't rely on me. So she invited Haman. Now the rumors started going around the, around Shushan. Esther invited Haman to the feast. They said, oh, okay. We thought she was uh, our friend. Obviously, she's a self-hating Jew. She, you know, we can't rely on her. And then they realized, okay, we literally have no one to li- rely on either the, other than the king. Rabbi Yossi, he says, he, uh, Esther wanted to find a moment. You know, there's always a good moment to strike, a moment to catch Haman off guard. And she said, well, how am I going to find that moment if he's off somewhere else? Let me invite him to the feast. I'll find a good moment. And if I find a good moment, I'll jump on it. Five more opinions. Rashim ben Nasia says, Hashem will notice that everyone's being kind to Haman, and this will kind of create this judgment in heaven. Like, why is Haman so virtuous that he gets to have so much kindness? And they'll start to judge him, and they'll say, "Oh, wait, so hold up, he's not judge- he's not virtuous in the slightest. He's actually a dreadful, horrible person." And this will um, this will create you know an accusation in heaven against him. Additionally, a different opinion of his is, or a different way of learning from his is that Hashem will notice that even I have to flatter such a wicked man, and that will kind of create a strain on Haman's you know heavenly grace, and that will be the his downfall. 
Rabbi Shulman Kacha gives a really interesting answer. He says, Esther wanted to be kind to Haman in order to make the king jealous. And then the king, in a rage of jealousy, will kill both Haman and Esther. And Esther said, well, if Haman's dead, well, hopefully that'll be the end of his decree as well. And that will be, you know, that I might die, but at least, you know, Haman went down with me. Rabbi Gamliel says, the king is fickle. The king was just a very fickle man, a man with, with emotions that flew in all different directions. And the, uh, Rabbi Gamliel said, the more Haman hung around Ahasuerus, the better chance it was he's going to do something wrong to upset Ahasuerus and, then get, and he's going to have himself killed. Esther said, I'm making a feast, fantastic, bring Haman. L- let him make one mistake and that'll just flare up. The king will be furious and the, that'll be the end of him. Rabbi Leza said, uh, um, um, Esther wanted to, to make the king and all the ministers jealous. Why is Haman going? The king will say, well, I thought we're having a romantic date and you're inviting my minister as well. What's going on? And also, all the ministers will be saying, Ahasuerus is having a meal with his wife and the only person that gets to go is Esther. Why is Haman so special? And it'll just create so much anger and resentment towards um, Haman and that's something that Esther desperately needed. Rabbah says, Esther knew the principle. Pride always goes before destruction. And so Esther said, let, let me make Haman as prideful as possible. And then he'll, you know, that will, the next step of that process will be his destruction. And the last opinion is Abaya and Rava says, when wicked people drink, bad things happen. And Esther knew that principle, that it happened many years earlier with King Belshazzar, and that's a story of its own. But Abaya and Rava said, she looked in the history books and said, these people, they, they, they drink. The story, for example, of, of Vashti. Where was Vashti killed? Vashti was killed when they all got drunk. She said, you know what? Let me invite Achashesh. Let me invite Haman as well. Let them get drunk and let their own bad things start to follow afterwards. These are 12 of different opinions on what Esther's motive was for inviting Haman. You can see she was highly motivated, but of course the question is, what was the right one? What was Esther actually thinking when, when she invited Haman to the, to the feast? What was her motive? And this is the brilliant twist of the whole story. There was a great rabbi called Rabbi Bar Avahu, and he once met Elio Hanabi, Elijah. Elijah came from heaven, then they were learning or discussing or talking, whatever it was. And he was curious. He had heard 12 different opinions on the reason why Esther invited Haman to the party. And he asked Eliyahu, Elijah, he asked him, what actually was the reason? You know, what, what, what was her motivation in inviting Haman? Because, you know, at first glance, it'd be very strange to invite such a wicked man to the party, especially when this is the man who made the decree. You know, you're, 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 you're playing a very dangerous game inviting that person. It's better to go behind his back and try to get it overturned. Why did Esther actually do it? What was the right answer? And the answer that Elio gave to Rabbi Balvo was a f- fantastic answer. He said, Esther was motivated from every single one of those 12 answers. She thought through the whole situation and came up with 12 reasons why Haman belongs to that party. And all the different opinions of the rabbis, it wasn't, they're not arguing with each other. It's all right versions of the 12 things that motivated Esther to invite Haman to this party. A very, very dangerous game because one misstep and now she has to contend with Haman in front of Ahasuerus, which of course was a very dangerous game. And God willing, in the next class, we'll talk about the actual feast itself.